They are not in fact special. What's special is you. Good afternoon, friends. Today, I want to tell you about how I believe magic mushrooms are best used. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video, and comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. Now, let's get started. First, I'd like to alert you to the fact that I've done a pharmacologic review of magic mushrooms before on this channel. But at the time, I wasn't sharing so many of my personal experiences on videos because I didn't know they were valuable for people. Moreover, I'd like to alert you to a different video, which is a video on Connor Murphy, on what happened to him from using psychedelic drugs, giving you basically my warnings on the dangers of psychedelic drug use. And by the way, a note for listeners, all of my videos are organized into playlists. That's the easiest way to go through my videos, not if you just go through them chronologically. So you'll be able to find the videos that are relevant to you through the playlist. First, what are magic mushrooms? Magic mushrooms are mushrooms, fungi, that have unusual chemicals that cause psychedelic effects in us. The two main chemicals that do that are psilocybin and its metabolite psilocin. But there are many other chemicals in mushrooms that have psychedelic effects, which makes each of the mushrooms slightly different. The most important chemical to the mechanisms of magic mushrooms is psilocybin or psilocin, the metabolite, which acts somewhat similarly. To fully understand how psilocybin works, you have to probably know a little bit about the serotonin system. We won't get into that too much here, but just note that I have a series called the Serotonergic Series. That series is the most comprehensive video series ever done on the serotonin system. If you watch it from the beginning to the end, you'll know more about serotonin than your psychiatrist does. But for now, I just want to alert you to the basic mechanisms of magic mushrooms, which I'll call psilocybin mushrooms from now on. Psilocybin mushrooms agonize two receptors in the brain that are very important. They're in the serotonin 2 series receptors. Those are 5 H HT, which means serotonin, 2A and 2C. Those are the 2A and 2C series in the serotonin system. What does that mean? That means psilocybin sort of acts like serotonin in your brain, but it acts like a selective kind of serotonin that doesn't bind to all of the serotonin receptors like the natural hormone does. Psilocybin binding to the 2A receptor is largely responsible for the acute hallucinogenic effects that people get when they trip, whereas its binding to the 2C receptor is largely responsible for its long-term effects when people microdose psilocybin. Next, what's tripping? Well, for those that don't know, there's the main way people use psilocybin psilocybin mushrooms is they essentially overdose on it and hallucinate when they take. Usually people do this for fun. College students are notorious for doing this. But in recent years, academics have been theorizing that these individual acute experiences can be an excellent treatment for mainly treatment resistant depression. The positive effects that have been described in people with treatment resistant depression who hallucinate on psilocybin mushrooms are essentially due to the change in perspective that someone has acutely when they take them. I can confirm having taken what's called hero's doses, the larger doses to hallucinate, that that indeed does happen but I have a couple of comments on the subject. First of all, the positive effects of taking a hero's dose, hallucinating on psilocybin mushrooms, really depends on how you live your lifestyle and what kind of person you are. So for example, if you come from a conservative community-based society in which you may have accepted some of your views in the world without maybe consciously analyzing them, maybe you've adopted some views. In fact, the less conscious you are as a person, the more potential it can have this subjective experience to change the way you think about the world. In general, I'd say two factors most determine this. The more consistent you are as a person, across your lifetime and the longer you lived, the more potential it may have to change you. And also the less conscious of a person you are, the more potential you may have to have a perspective shift. On the other hand, if you're a person like me that's very conscious of their own thoughts, that's always questioned their beliefs and always thought rigorously about themselves, that doesn't follow culture and doesn't follow patterns of living from other people, you might not experience a major shift. On the other hand, the second comment I want to make is these hallucinations that may have a, a great benefit, that's a conscious benefit by the way. By the way, the way they benefit people is that they see the world from a different perspective acutely and then they remember that perspective afterwards realizing there's a different way to look at the world but this potential benefit comes with great risks if you're genetically predisposed to schizophrenia or bipolar disorder which by the way almost all of us are to some degree even if you don't have somebody in your family that has those diseases in general I'd say the biggest risk for damaging your personality and your brain long term developing schizophrenia or something like that comes from the first couple of times you use it if you've used it a couple of times at hero's doses and not developed schizophrenia yet the risk I think from my personal experience and watching people declines for the next few doses until you begin using it chronically at which point the risk increases with more time such that if you do it once a month for a few years you may end up damaging your brain slightly even if you're not predisposed to it much so that's one way psilocybin is used to have a hallucinogenic experience see the world differently and remember that experience that may allow you to look at your life differently later this is just a subjective experience that consciously changes the way you behave the other way psilocybin is frequently used today and it's become very very popular and trendy especially among people that like to be trendy is microdosing psilocybin. I've noticed that these hipster type trendy people tend to have misunderstandings about the real value of psilocybin. First of all, they tend to think that psilocybin is healthy or psilocybin mushrooms are healthy because they're natural. This is an absolute fallacy. There is nothing particularly safe about natural 
chemicals that makes synthetic chemicals particularly dangerous. Well, I suppose that's not really true because historically we may have potentially adapted to more natural molecules than we would to synthetic molecules which didn't exist before. But there's nothing innately good or about consuming natural products. A lot of people think that since this is a natural product, it can't harm me. That's not really true. Moreover, I'd like to point out to you that its naturalness doesn't make it particularly special. So for example, just like there's a lot of people microdosing psilocybin mushrooms, there are a lot of people microdosing LSD and they have similar effects because they work through similar pharmacologic mechanisms. Or for example, let's take the more pointed example of opioids. Generally right now, I bet when you heard the word opioids, you have a negative connotation to it. You may not realize that we have natural opioids in our body. We call them endorphins. Many people use this word and don't know what it means. Moreover, beyond having our own natural opioids, opioids come from plants in nature as well. In fact, they come from a poppy plant and they've been used for thousands of years, just as long as marijuana has been. And yet opioids are so dangerous that they've been used as weapons. For example, Britain used opioids as chemical warfare to the Chinese. And thanks to this chemical warfare, a large segment of the Chinese population of the 19th century became addicted to opioids. That's where opium dens come from. The Chinese built these sort of houses to, for the opium addicts to sit at and just smoke their opium all day. And if you're thinking that synthetic opioids are much worse than opium, for example, I'd like to point out to you that right now in the country of Iran, there are tons of opium addicts. In fact, so much so that a lot of these Persians, when they come to America, become addicted to heroin. And that brings up heroin. By the way, heroin is a natural product derived directly from the plant. It's not synthetic in any way. The way hashish is a concentrated form of cannabis from the cannabis plant, heroin is a concentrated form of the poppy plant. Second, a major misunderstanding is that psilocybin mushrooms have something magical magical or special about them. They are not in fact special. What's special is you. Your serotonin system is what's producing those results, not the drug. The drug is just working on your brain's receptors. The real magic is actually in your brain, not in that plant. And to point this out to you further, again, the synthetic LSD has similar effects, and then you can look at SSRIs. SSRIs produce similar effects in the long term to microdosing LSD or psilocybin. They just have a horrible reputation because some people have poor experiences with it and then report those experiences to others. Well, think about all the people who had horrible experiences on psilocybin and mushrooms as well. SSRIs are equally or more effective. In fact, comparison studies show that they're similarly effective. So what exactly do psilocybin mushrooms do? Well, I'm going to mention three mechanisms by which they cause these effects, in both in the short term and in the long term. The first thing is that they agonize the 5-HT2A receptors. The 2A receptors, when they're agonized, they cause dopamine transmission. That's why if you microdose psilocybin in the morning, you might feel more uh, driven, ambitious, more energetic. That's the dopamine transmission. That's consequent to the serotonin system. By the way, very few people know about this. Very few people know that this drug causes direct dopamine transmission through the serotonin 2A series. In fact, the mushroom experts like Paul Stamets would be hard pressed to tell you how it works. Although they're not hard pressed to give you schedules of dosing four on, three off with niacin, which is just ridiculous. So how do psilocybin mushrooms exert their effects? Well, remember those serotonin 2A and 2C receptors. We're gonna talk about them briefly. I'm gonna tell you some things about them that even mushroom experts usually don't know. First, the 5-HT2A receptor, when it's agonized acutely, causes dopamine transmission. It also causes adrenaline transmission. This is called dopaminergic and adrenergic activity. That activity is actually responsible for the anxiety-inducing called anxiogenic. Anxio is related to anxiety and genic means producing something, increasing something. So the anxiogenic effect of psilocybin mushrooms, particularly the hero's doses, is exerted through the 2A receptor. Which, by the way, the serotonin receptors are not all calming. They have opposing effects depending on the individual receptors. And since psilocybin is selective, we have to talk about the individual receptors. Anyway, agonism of the 2A receptor causes acute dopamine transmission. That's why if you microdose psilocybin in the morning, you might find yourself more driven, more energetic, in a slightly better mood. It's a kind of mild euphoria. But this is also the reason that people end up hallucinating and developing severe anxiety with hero's doses. It's that 2A receptor. So the acute effect is increasing dopaminergic and adrenergic activity in the brain. What's the chronic effect of the 2A receptor agonism for those that microdose? Well, I'll tell you, a lot of people have not thought about this properly before. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say what I'm about to say, but what happens acutely is that dopamine transmission exists. In the long term, the 2A receptor downregulates. In fact, to be honest with you, it downregulates even acutely, even from a single dose. It immediately downregulates the receptor. So if you microdose psilocybin continuously, what happens is the 2A receptor downregulates. Usually when the serotonin 2A receptor downregulates, so does the 2C receptor. So most likely both receptors are downregulating. When that happens, when the 2A and 2C receptors downregulate, dopamine transmission also is elevated. In fact, that's how some atypical antidepressants work. For example, the new antidepressant agomelatine upregulates dopamine signaling by blocking the A and C receptors. It also reduces anxiety through the same mechanism. 
because of the anxiogenic effects of the 2A receptor. So blocking them up regulates dopamine transmission a bit. And trust me, I know these effects because I've used drugs to block these receptors to feel what it was like when I was doing the serotonin series. You get a dopamine up regulation the longer you block them. Moreover, since the 2A receptor is anxiogenic, blocking them acutely reduces anxiety, which is an unusual thing. Usually upregulating dopaminergic transmission causes an increase in anxiety. But blocking these two receptors both increases dopamine and reduces anxiety. So what did I just say here? Acutely, this drug causes an increase in dopamine transmission. In the long term, by down-regulating the receptors, it will also increase dopamine transmission. This sounds illogical, but it's true. I've experienced these drugs myself and I've felt the effects. So what chronically microdosing psilocybin will do to your dopamine system is that if every time you take the psilocybin dose in the morning, you'll get a little bit of dopamine transmission acutely, even if the receptors are down-regulated. So you'll become basically, you'll regulate your dopamine system. You'll become slightly dependent on this agonism every morning. It's like your cup of coffee, for example. But the long-term beneficial effect also will be a reduction and anxiety and also a slight upregulation of the dopamine system which is also now dependent slightly on this drug and by the way a side note I wanted to mention that the serotonin system generally down regulates through something called an autoreceptor in particular the 5-HT1 series A is one of the most powerful autoreceptors and I believe personally that down regulation of the serotonin system with the use of SSRIs is one of the main reasons people have side effects the first couple of weeks and that's the reason I always recommend to psychiatrists to try to co-administer the SSRI during the first couple of weeks with low dose propranolol. Propranolol's side effect is it blocks the 5-HT1A receptor, causing the serotonin series not to downregulate. The second and most desirable effect, in my opinion, that microdosing psilocybin has is through the 5-HT2C receptor. That receptor is the main receptor that drives serotonergic neurogenesis in the brain. What's serotonergic neurogenesis? That means neurogenesis that is derived of serotonin related to serotonin's activities. Serotonin modulates something called neurogenesis. That's how our brain develops new cells. It continues to do this in adulthood, but it exports exponentially decreases after the age of 20, such that by the age of 30, we barely experience any new cells in our brain. The serotonin system directly modulates growth factors in the brain, like brain-derived neurotrophic factors. That's how SSRIs are thought to work. Well, one of the reasons they're thought to work. So what happens when you microdose psilocybin is you're constantly agonizing that 5-HT2C receptor. First, it downregulates, but eventually it keeps getting that signal. And that signal will be higher for somebody microdosing psilocybin than someone natural. What will happen is basically they'll have higher growth factors in their brain in adulthood. What are the effects of that? Well, increasing neurogenesis across most mammals produces an anxiolytic and antidepressant phenotype. What does that mean? That means a kind of behavior in which the mammal acts less anxiety-ridden and less depressive. So in humans, developing increased neurogenesis, which takes usually a couple of months, will produce an anxiolytic antidepressant effect in most people. But it also does something even more powerful which is it allows you to sort of reconfigure your brain, adapt to your lifestyle later in life. You see, our brains are mostly developed in childhood and our teenage years and sort of solidified in our early 20s, such that we can't really adapt to changing circumstances that much. The change that neurogenesis creates in the brain is called plasticity. It's sort of an adaptability of the brain. And basically, it, this allows you to adapt to your new life circumstances. So in addition to directly reducing anxiety and reducing depressive symptoms, it also allows you to be agile, mentally agile, to adapt to your life. How neuro Genesis feels is that, for example, if you're somebody that ruminates on certain topics that bother them, you'll find it much harder to ruminate when you have higher neurogenesis. I always say you can't teach an old dog new tricks because the old dog doesn't have growth factors in the brain. The brain is rigid. It can't learn that much, it can't change that much. Now bear in mind a side note, this is somewhat protective for certain diseases. For example, if you were about to develop schizophrenia, you wouldn't want your brain to be very plastic because you're encouraging the brain to change even more with this pathological pattern that it's developing. But if you don't have something going on like that, if you're somebody that's really stuck in their ways, maybe neurotic, thinks over things, stuff like that, can't adapt to their life circumstances, increasing neurogenesis can be life-changing, whether it's through an SSRI or through cerebral lysin or through microdosing psilocybin. But I'm not despairing psilocybin mushrooms in any way. I really believe they're a very useful tool. They're useful because of our serotonin systems. I'm just trying to clarify that they're not innately useful and that they're magical or something like that. All right, moving on. Next, since we discovered that magic mushrooms are not magical, but they really work through our magical serotonin systems, let's talk about some advice I can give you from my extensive experience using them. First of all, if you've ever used psilocybin mushrooms before, you probably used one strain. It's called Cubensis. It was the first strain that was domesticated and therefore it's the most available strain. What does that mean? Well, many psilocybin and mushrooms can only be grown on the, what's called the mycelium. That's like a structure of fungi under the earth. Most have to be grown on land. But some were domesticated, so they can be grown off land. The first one is Cubensis, also called the golden teacher. 
If you've tried mushrooms and didn't know which strain you were using, you were probably using Golden Teacher. The Golden Teacher is really a well-rounded strain. It's not a horrible strain at all. But the strains of psilocybin mushrooms differ almost as much as the strains of marijuana differ. So for example, imagine you're from the UK and you've only tried cheese. That's a strain of marijuana. Imagine you called marijuana cheese. You only knew cheese. And then suddenly you go to Amsterdam and you try Amnesia Haze. It's a totally different feeling, but it's also a cannabis plant. The psilocybin mushrooms maybe don't differ quite as widely as marijuana strains. Maybe not quite. I'm just thinking that the fact that the marijuana strains have been grown to exaggerate their differences, but they are very different. Now, you might not have expected it, but I've probably tried more mushroom strains than anyone you know, particularly psilocybin mushrooms, I mean. Some of my favorites are Eleni, CNSNs, Azurens. There's many very interesting strains, but they're very hard to procure because most of them, as I said, have to be grown on the mycelium. On the other hand, you can easily buy what's called spore which is what you need to grow your own golden teacher mushrooms or other mushrooms and you can easily buy kits to grow mushrooms in your bathroom online by the way in fact if you want to grow your own a great resource is the subreddit spores you can go on spores buy some spores very cheaply and then you can go online and find a kit to grow golden teacher mushrooms you can grow it in your own bathroom quite easily within a couple of months but if you're a frequent user of mushrooms if you do decide that you really like them and you've only tried the golden teacher I would highly recommend that you try others you might become a kind of connoisseur of sorts and try different strains and find out that you may prefer other ones like I do Next, a quick tip. If you get your mushrooms, be sure not to eat them whole. When I see people do that, I cringe. That's so unprofessional. The psilocybin across the mushroom differs, such that if you take a bite from it, you're getting a differing amount of psilocybin each time and don't really know how much you're taking. What you need to do is when you get your mushrooms, you need to grind them in a coffee grinder, put them in a bottle and put them in your freezer. And then when you want to use mushrooms, weigh them out. Buy a diamond scale from Amazon, and put the powder into the scale so that you're getting a regular amount each time so you can know which doses work for you. Speaking of doses, let's get into that. Most people use two dosing schedules. They either microdose it, usually in the morning. They they usually don't know why they're microdosing it. Like Paul Stamets has this four on, three off schedule, which really doesn't make sense. Stamets is being confused because most likely he's getting the dopaminergic effect. Like you guys know, I like to take amphetamines on a four on, three off schedule myself, but that's because of the dopaminergic effect. The really great effect from microdosing psilocybin mushrooms is actually the effect on neurogenesis. To get that, you don't have to take three days off. In fact, taking three days off won't really upregulate those receptors much anyway. So if you do microdose, don't take days off. There's really no reason to do that. If you're trying to get a dopaminergic effect out of psilocybin, there are better drugs for that. But if you're trying to get neurogenesis, it does make sense to microdose psilocybin mushrooms, but not to take days off. And by the way, there are other weird things about that schedule, like adding niacin to it, but I don't want to get too off track. But anyway, so there's a microdosing schedule. At that schedule, you usually use between 50 milligrams to 300 milligrams, depending on the strain. Some of the early Earlier exotic strains that I mentioned are much stronger than the Golden Teacher. For reference, when I used to microdose the Golden Teacher, I needed about 300 milligrams, whereas some women I know take between 50 to 100 milligrams. I would recommend you never use more than 300 milligrams, no matter how big you are or what tolerance you have. There's no reason to. You'll get the neurogenesis effect from taking 300 or less for sure, and you should use the minimal effective dose that you need. So if you feel a dopaminergic effect from 50 milligrams, that means your metabolism is not so fast that you need a higher dose. You're feeling it in your brain, and you're gonna get the serotonergic effect. It's just going to take some time. It's going to take a couple of months. The other dosing schedule that people regularly use is for that hallucinogenic psychedelic effect when you want to get a subjective experience. Usually people call this the hero's dose and they usually do it in some safe environment and they usually do it rarely. You would never do over a gram regularly. You'd really downregulate the serotonin system. You start to get less of the benefits you want and more of the side effects. I'm not going to get into what doses people use for that because I don't really recommend that at all. I think microdosing is very valuable but the hero's dose while it may benefit the majority of people even, it will really, really harm some people. And the harm to them, I think, outweighs the benefit to the others. So for those of you that want to take that risk, you can Google Heroes Dose Golden Teacher and see what people use. I would highly recommend you be careful because you may do something that you can't undo. And that will not happen at a microdose or the other dose schedule, which I'm about to recommend, which I've never heard anyone recommend, by the way. My extensive experimentation with psilocybin mushrooms led me to realize that they have another beneficial effect, which is that instead of going out on a weekend and having a few beers with your friends, you you can actually do a much healthier thing for your body. You see, alcohol is really a horrible drug. It's very unhealthy, both for your brain and for your body. Psilocybin mushrooms at the dose schedule I'm about to tell you are much more healthy, and you can get a similar dopaminergic, slightly euphoric effect with a slight visual effect of colors and stuff like that without developing anxiety or having major hallucinations. The dose for that is usually between 400 milligrams to 1,000. 
I wouldn't go over a gram. If you do it more frequently, you'll notice quickly that you'll become resistant to its effects. You'll need a gram and a half. Don't do that. Don't do it more than once a week. But if you go out with friends once a week and have a few beers, this may be an excellent opportunity for harm reduction. Out of all my experience using hedonistic drugs, which by the way, for those that don't know, I'm mostly a teetotaler now. I used to be an alcoholic and I have extensive experience with hedonistic drugs. Although I don't think people should live hedonistically, if people do want to use hedonistic drugs, I think there are three drugs that are somewhat safe. They're all safer than alcohol in my opinion. And they are this dosing schedule, 400 milligrams to a gram of psilocybin mushrooms, cannabis, and GHB. Unfortunately, GHB has a very bad reputation and it shouldn't really. It's much safer than alcohol. Much, much safer. Anyway, I mainly made this video to point out that magic mushrooms are magical because of your serotonin system and that there's another dosing schedule which is valuable, which is an intermediate dose. Personally, I would not use a hero's dose ever. I would use a microdose if you're so averse to SSRIs or I would use the hedonistic dose of 400 milligrams to a gram once a week at maximum. So to recap, natural things aren't innately safe. Heroin is also natural and magic mushrooms are not magical your serotonin system is magic long-term microdosing of magic mushrooms will modulate your dopamine system and neurogenesis the dopamine effect is what's attracting most people to it but it's the neurogenesis effect that keeps them using it and produces the long-term really beneficial effects the dopaminergic effect can be mimicked with better drugs in my opinion third there's an intermediate dose that most people don't experiment with and that's very valuable in my opinion and much safer than using a hero's dose and may leave you without ever having bad experiences from using these drugs. And finally, if you're somebody that really does enjoy psilocybin mushrooms, you should probably try the other rarer strains. They're really enjoyable and you'll eventually become somewhat of a connoisseur of them. Anyway guys, thank you for bearing with me. I hope this was a little bit helpful for you and I hope to see you again tomorrow morning.